So what are the righteous to do when everything seems to be crumbling? That's what David wrestles with today in Psalm 11. Feel free to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles to Psalm 11. We're going to be spending the duration of our morning there, kind of a one-off Sunday um, before we begin a new sermon series next week. Oh, I'm supposed to show a video. Sorry. Show the video. Yeah, yeah, show the video. That'll be better. Can you do that now? Or are we late? Summoned and summoned yearly to come adore Christ the Lord. O come all ye faithful is a crowd favorite, and we are the faithful, and we want to come and behold the one who was born the king of angels. But how? What can we give him? Even the little drummer boy said, I have no gift to bring that's fit for a king. If we want to offer King Jesus more than just a parumpa pum pum, we need to know what is required in biblical worship. Join us next week as we begin a four-part sermon series on biblical worship. Oh, how shall we adore him? So there we go. Now you've seen the promo video, right? So um, kind of a one-off week here as we think about the beginning of the week of Thanksgiving. Next week we're going to kind of start a Christmas series, but really talk about what is biblical worship for the next four weeks. Uh, we finished up Ephesians a couple weeks back and had baptism, so that's what we're, uh, we're doing here today. So Psalm 11, what should the righteous one be doing, or what can the righteous be doing, or have they done, when everything seems to be crumbling around them? I already mentioned that jobs have been jeopardized, the family unit has been redefined, in our culture, marriage has been mocked, gender is now fluid, and the government has seemingly become more invasive in the day-to-day matters of all of our lives. Nothing seems to be as it was. And even the local churches and mainline denominations that once had levied walls protecting their membership from ungodliness and unrighteousness, some of those denominations and mainline churches have taken a wrecking ball to the levy, and they've become synagogues of Satan, and the currents of popular culture have swept them away. What should the righteous be doing? In these cases, what should the righteous do? What do we do when the foundations are being destroyed and they're floating away? If you've wrestled with these questions, or at least had them come across and drift across your minds, I want you to know that's exactly the dilemma that David found himself in as he writes Psalm 11. I want to give you the textual idea and then defend it in the scripture itself throughout the rest of our time here. The big idea, the textual idea that we get from Psalm 11 is this. When everything around us seems to be collapsing, the righteous ought to take refuge in the Lord. When everything around us seems to be collapsing, and maybe it's not just seems, maybe it is, we don't know, but by well, by just meaning of observations, like, man, things are not the same as they used to be. What should we, the righteous, be doing? That's the teaching point of this text. So let's let the word of God be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Let's give our attention to the Lord and let him speak and let us find out, just like the author of Proverbs 35, 30 verse 5 says, every word of God proves true. So let's turn to Psalm 11. It'll be on the screen as well. This is what David says. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow, and they have fitted the arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, What can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind, shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. 
May the Lord add his blessing to those who read and those who hear and those who trust in the promises that this scripture is making and make it applicable to their lives as we obey this word today. So here's the historical context. We don't know what it is. (laughs) Of this psalm, there's not consensus among biblical scholars as to the exact historical context of this psalm. The unfortunate reality is that in the life of David, this could have happened a thousand times, right? If you're familiar with the story of David, he was, he was a man that was afflicted a lot. There's a lot of tragedy in his life. He's so many perilous situations throughout his life. It could have been any number of those situations when Saul was trying to kill him or his own son was trying to kill him or whatever it might have been. It could have been one that's not even recorded in the scriptures for us. It could have been another situation. We just don't know why he wrote this or what the situation was in which he wrote it. Knowing the exact historical setting of the psalm is really unimportant, though, because we all know what it feels like to have the ground shaking underneath our feet or, this last week, seeing everything floating away downstream. So that's that's what we know that we know what it's like to live in a world where there's difficulties and afflictions. And so what do we do? Well, verses 1 through 3 is pretty sad. Look at it. It says this, In the Lord I take refuge. So that's where we're going to get to at the end. That's why I gave you the textual idea at the beginning. But we're going to make work our way to the end there. But look at what we have to do to go through. This is the counsel of despair that David was given. Look at what they say. Those surrounding David are saying to David who is going through conflict and turmoil. He says to them, How can you say to my soul, Flee like a bird to your mountain, for behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's what, that's what people surrounding David are saying to him. This is the advice that people surrounding David, more than likely David's very own men, are saying. Basically what they're saying is, why don't you just go ahead and give up on this idea that a righteous God will take care of his business in a right way. Clearly, God is incapable of handling his business. Look at this mess, David. Look, David, the foundations are destroyed, so why don't we just get out of here? Have you ever felt hopeless? Have you ever been given hopeless advice? Have you ever given hopeless advice because the situation just seemed so bleak? These words here, this counsel of despair, are essentially the words of Chicken Little, right? The sky is falling, David. Like it's just collapsing on itself. And the foundations are being destroyed. So, flee like a bird to your mountain. Let's flee, David. We are birds. We don't belong out here in the valley, but back up in those hills, there just might be some refuge for us there. So let's go. Let's not be putting our beaks out where they don't belong if we don't need to. We can be sure of this. If we do that, we will become targets. There will be imminent danger because the wicked will put an arrow on a string and bend the bow and then shoot at us in the dark. That's a pretty grim and dangerous situation for the righteous one to be in, right? I wouldn't want to be in that situation. When the ground beneath your feet is shaking and the foundations are being destroyed, that's pretty scary stuff. We can see that it is Exactly a precarious situation to be in if indeed you are the righteous one in a world that loves its darkness. But I love what David says here. He is so absolutely direct with those who are telling him directly to flee. Look at what he says. He aggressively meets their charged questions with a charged question of his own. How can you say this to me? In modern language, it's almost like, how dare you say this to me to flee? This is David's heart that is swelled with confidence in God and in God alone. Because if you and I were able to look and observe his circumstances, whatever they specifically were in Psalm 11, I would say that his friend's advice seems rather logical and fitting. 
So how could David look at this situation so differently? Well, let's, first of all, let's see if it's logical and fitting to want to flee. Okay, what is David up against here? Well, let's assess the situation. Let's observe the threat in verse 2. Being shot at by an arrow on a bow seems to be a legitimate threat to me, right? Does that make sense? If you've ever been shot by an arrow, you probably can't testify to it because you probably bled out in a field somewhere and you're not here. An arrow whizzing through the nighttime air and heading straight for your upright heart, yeah, I'd want somebody to warn me about that one. That just might sting a bit. That's the threat that David is facing. And not only to add insult to injury, but look at verse 3. Basically, there is nothing that the righteous can do to stop the foundations from being destroyed. Or there's also a variant reading you can see in any good Bible. We'll point out variant readings at the bottom of the text there. There is nothing that the righteous has done or will be able to do, if the variant reading is correct, to stop them from being destroyed. Either news is bad news if you're the righteous one. What we see here in these three verses is that those who are in power are wicked and they are trying to kill the righteous ones. Whoa! Do you think that David is culturally relevant for today? (laughs) The world is caving in on itself. The entire system seems to be failing. And so the wicked say, David, checkmate. I win the argument. The foundation's gone. So heed my advice. Flee. Get out of here. Remove yourself and take with you your false self, self, uh, self, false self of inflated importance and your so-called influence. Just get out of here. We want nothing to do with you. Just get out. But is that what a person of faith should do? Is that the way we should live And you know what David says? He says, how can you say that to me? How how dare you say that to me? Yes, that's my reality. There is an arrow coming at me. I am a sitting duck. I am a target. But how can you tell me to flee? David doesn't agree with the advice He says in this psalm, when everything around us seems to be collapsing, the righteous shouldn't just run for the hills. We ought to take refuge in the Lord. The world is flooded with darkness, but we shouldn't run from it. Rather, we need to shine light into that darkness. Listen, we live in a society where it's acceptable to give two thumbs up to the cruel actions of harvesting and selling body parts of fully intact aborted babies while being outraged at people who say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays because they don't want Jesus inserted anywhere in the story of humanity. That's weird. That's strange. This place is messed up. We live in a world that has shifted, and we live in a world that has been broken from the fall, and it never really once was what we thought it was. Just because a culture as a whole embraced Christian morals as an acceptable and even preferred way of life doesn't mean that the culture was Christian. The ideologies we embrace don't make God pleased with us. We can clean the outside of the cup all we want, but if the inside is dirty, then we're certainly not clean, nor are we pleasing to the Father. Jesus quoted Isaiah, who was quoting the God of heaven when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is based on merely human rules as they have been taught. So, there is financial instability. There are environmental issues. There is societal violence. There really are injustices happening all around the globe. So flee to the mountains, right, David? Just get out of here. Just go hole up somewhere. This is certainly tempting. What mountain range do you want to flee to? Where are you tempted to find refuge besides in the Lord? 
You know, some of us are tempted to flee to the mountain range of distraction where we just engage in mind-numbing activities like we candy crush it to death, right? Or we Netflix or Hulu or whatever it might be or we use drugs or alcohol just to kind of distract us from the craziness that are out there. We flee to those mountains or we flee to the lowly mountains of social media where our identity is inseparably linked to the social media accounts that you hold, right? Every time you go there, you feel more isolated and lonely, but it's tempting to go there to live out this persona of a person online. Or the mountain range of despair, woe is me. Or let's all just duck and cover. Or let's move out of state where the grass might be greener for a while. Now I want to be careful because some of you listening to this have made that decision and it might be the right decision for your family. I've had people congratulate me when I was in Illinois. They said, oh, thank goodness you're getting out of Illinois. And then I told them I'm moving to Washington. (laughs) And I get to Washington and I miss my Egypt, right? Or let's go to Idaho. Let's go to Montana. Let's go to any red state, right? It's not the promised land. The promised land is the entire globe because the promise that was made long ago to Abraham has been ratified and expanded by the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. He is ruling and reigning now and his kingdom will come in its fullness when he comes with a double-edged sword that proceeds from his mouth while separating the sheep from the goats and the wheat from the chaff. There will be even hope for Washington State when all things are made new. God is reigning. The promised land is the whole earth. He redeemed it. But the advice does seem to be good advice because arrows are being made ready to be drunk with David's blood. So the logical thing for David to do would be to run away. But in David's mind, that's absurd. He says, why? Why would I run away? Why would I flee? He doesn't run because he knows that running and what he can run to and he can construct as a refuge by his own hands won't bring him any refuge at all. David knows that only refuge comes from being in the Lord or with the Lord, as he says in verse 1 and 7. We've all experienced this, right? When we work out a situation so that we feel comfortable with the outcome, But eventually it leaves us empty and anxious and worried and nervous and fearful and fretful and self-focused and overly cautious because we really can't control what's outside of us that's coming at us. We dream about greener grass everywhere else, but we fail to see in the green pastures that we are currently laying down in because Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. When we're so satisfied with him and his provisions and him being our shepherd, we say we don't want other things. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You mean even when bow and arrow is pointed at us and shooting at us at the upright? Yes, he can still make me lie down in green pastures and he will lead me beside the still waters. So we try our hardest to understand why bad things are happening, and we try to map out the inscrutable ways of the Lord, and we end up getting exhausted. And we try to understand why God would do certain things in certain ways, and we do so without his eternal perspective or his perfect providence, and we run out of breath as we try to ascend the mountain of self-sustenance. We successfully make it into the death zone, and then we run out of oxygen, And as it turns out, we start to realize, oh, wait, I am not God. So while David's advisors say, run, flee, retreat, disengage, let's see what David has to say. Because he says, that advice is absurd, even if it seems logical. This is David's response of faith in verses 4 through 6. He says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coal on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup.
David's response to the logical advice from his counselors concerning the legitimate threat that he was actually experiencing is rooted in what he knows to be true of God. Oh, to be like this. He assessed the situation that he was actually in from a theological perspective. He looked at the situation he was in through the lenses of what he knew to be true of God. Well, what did he know about God? Well, let's look at verse 4. He said, the Lord is in his holy temple. In the Hebrew, this sounds like something Yoda would say. God is in his holy temple. Or Yahweh in temple of holiness is. He emphasizes Yahweh first. He is the covenant God, the one who is my God. Yahweh in temple of holiness is. So there's craziness down here, but yet God is still in his temple of holiness. And God is reigning from the throne, or as Yoda would say, or the Hebrew word would say, Yahweh in the heaven chair is. All right? So we got Yahweh in temple of holinesses. Yahweh in the heaven chair is. He is. God is in his holy temple. God is reigning from his throne. God is aware of all things. His eyes see. You might need to think about those three words this week. His eyes see. He's not oblivious or unaware when he's sitting in his heaven chair, when he's ruling from there, when he is in his temple of holiness, he still sees what's happening down here. So God's in his holy temple. God is running from the throne. God is aware of all things, and here's the crazy one. God is conducting all things in order to test what's in the heart of all mankind. Look at this. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. So Yahweh in temple of holiness is, Yahweh in the heaven chair is, Yahweh sees all things, and he's conducting all things to test what's in the hearts of mankind. Now look at verse 5, where there is a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked Both the righteous and the wicked are being observed by the Holy One who is ruling from the heaven chair. He is orchestrating the current events that David was finding himself in, and there are two potential outcomes for the test. He will either pass the test or he will fail the test, so that begs the question, what is the determining factor that will either make you pass or fail the test that God brings about in your life? What must David do? There's two potential outcomes. You can pass the test, and you'll be considered righteous. As it says in 1 Peter 1, look at this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you now rejoice Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, even though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we receive the fiery trials... And we take refuge in the Lord, knowing what's in store for us and his provisions of daily bread even now. We receive those fiery trials, take refuge in the Lord throughout the duration, and we pass the test because the sustenance that we receive from the Lord during the trial is more pleasurable than any false refuge that we are tempted to run to. Pass the test. Or... We fail the test and are wicked. 
These are strong words. I don't know if, Katie, if you can go back a couple slides to get verses 4 through 6. I forgot to put that in there. These are strong words. It says this, his soul hates them. Do you see that? Go back one or two more, Katie. That'd be awesome. His soul hates them. There is a Christian cliche phrase that says God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Well, God says in this verse, my soul hates them, not just their sin. Sinners will be sent to hell, not just their sin. This passage actually says that he abhors the sinner. Don't overestimate or overemphasize God's love and underestimate and underemphasize his wrath. Our sin does not exist outside of us. It's at the core of who we are. And we have a holy God who is dead set against sin. That's the beauty of the cross, people. Please don't demean the value of the precious blood of the Lamb to be culturally appropriate by saying that God doesn't hate sinners. Why? Because it was the Lord's will to crush Jesus, who was pierced for what? Our transgressions, our sins. God meted out that judgment on Jesus. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds were healed. He stood in our place. He absorbed the wrath and the hatred of God that, he, that we deserved. It was poured out on Jesus. Don't demean the value of the precious blood of Jesus by saying God doesn't really care if you're unrighteous. No. Now, I think we say that sometimes to be culturally relevant for evangelistic purposes. I get that. But this verse does say that God abhors the sinner, not just the sin. And if you're still not convinced that God might have a distaste for sinners and not just the sin that they commit, then verse 6 is going to be a very tough pill to swallow. Does God hate the wicked? Well, look at verse 6. I don't know how to reconcile the actions of a God who rains down coals of fire on people if really deep down he wasn't that offended by them and their sin. I can't wrap my brain around the scenario, well, well, they're well-intended people that come to God thirsty and parched, and he fills up a cup full of fire, sulfur, and scorching hot wind, and hands it over to them and says, here, try this, see if that'll do the trick. It doesn't make sense. What does make sense is that if these people are coming to God for partial refuge, all the while knowing that they're really just appeasing him for a time, and the map leading back to their false mountain ranges of refuge is folded neatly in their back pocket. You do that, you fail the test. If God is not your refuge, then something else will be, and you will fail the test. Because his eyelids see. So let's go back to the teaching point of the text and start to wrap this up. When everything around us seems to be collapsing, the righteous ought to take refuge in the Lord. So here we go. First of all, <laughs> I so often fail to feel like I'm righteous. So does this even apply to me or you, right? Who is righteous and how do you become righteous before a holy God when the scriptures teach that there is no one righteous, not even one? Well, those same scriptures teach us that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. It's the gospel message. He took your place. And if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth your need for Jesus, you will be saved. And you will become blameless and righteous and above reproach. That, my friends, is grace. And it's being offered to you by God. Today. So become righteous, not because of your merits, but because of the merits of another one, and then take refuge in the Lord. This psalm has now come full circle from verses 1 and 7. Take refuge in the Lord and behold his face. 
I want to combine verse 1a and 7 because this is the main idea of the psalm. Psalm 11 verse 1a and 7 together says this, In the Lord I take refuge, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. Well, what does taking refuge look like? Well, refuge is a place that you go to find safety, to find rest, to find comfort, a trusted place to be kept safe. Listen. A change in your circumstances isn't your refuge. Because God has already removed the biggest hurdle for your rest. He has removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. And you are safe from his judgment. And he is currently and continually smiling on you because of what Jesus has done for you. You might be undergoing some horrific and scary things right now. But know this, that the Lord is righteous and in all that he does, he is acting righteously. And we need to have a shift in our perspective. And instead of saying, why is God allowing this to happen in my life? We say, since God is allowing this to happen... He must be doing something with it. It must be producing some eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. Because we know for certain that those who love God, all things are working together for good. For those who have been called according to his purpose, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his son. And he's pretty pleased with his son. And we can be fueled by the confidence that one day we will behold his face. That's where our refuge is. Refuge is found and peace is experienced in the certain hope of the future reality of beholding the face of our God. That's where it's found. Not in the change of your circumstances. If you're going to look to that, it will leave you empty and dry. So what should we do when God, or even an enemy of God, after wandering to and fro in the earth, sees you like he saw Job those many years ago, and he marks you in the crosshairs of his deadly, fiery, poison-tipped arrow and unleashes hell on you and your family? If that's your case and the dust settles, or the flood waters recede, if you say like Job, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, you pass the test. Because your refuge wasn't found in your possessions or in your optimal living arrangements. People, the sky isn't falling. It's still up there. But even if it was falling, it wouldn't matter because the one who himself is our refuge is continually building his universal church across the globe. And he has been throughout the ages. And the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That is true. So on this day that starts off our week of thanksgiving, we can actually do what Paul tells the Thessalonians to do. We can give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. (laughs) We don't give thanks for all circumstances. We're not masochists, we're not gluttons for punishment. Rather, we give thanks in all circumstances. Our gratitude 
isn't in proportion to the pleasantness of our circumstances. Are you hearing this? It's in direct proportion to how we seek refuge in God while in those circumstances. Our gratitude isn't in proportion to the pleasantness of our circumstances. It is in direct proportion to how we seek refuge in God while in those circumstances. It is our duty to be thankful in all circumstances because we have made the Lord our refuge alone and he has made us righteous in his sight. So the flood waters will certainly rise in our lives and things will be inconvenient or we may suffer massive losses in this life. But we are anchored to the reality of the ability of the one who in Psalm 29 says of himself, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And so we, the righteous, receive his strength and his peace becomes a reality regardless of our circumstances. God, I pray for us clearly a hard message to make feel right But we are not people that walk by our feelings. We are people that walk by our faith until that faith becomes sight when we are able to behold one day the face of our maker. That is where our refuge is found. So God, we do pray, first of all, for people that are experiencing devastating loss And clearly their living circumstances right now are not optimal. I pray that in these moments that somehow they would cry out to you for you to sustain them. That the church would be mobilized to go be a light shining in a very dark place. In a very muddied and soggy and destroyed place. And God I pray that out of the overflow of us seeking refuge and safety and rest in the midst of all the trials and circumstances that we find ourselves in, that that from that place of security, that anchored, tethered hope to beholding you one day face to face will overflow from us as we are mobilized into our community to do the work of rebuilding places and caring for people and being an extension of the hands and feet of you, Jesus. God, I pray that our sure and steady anchor would be in Christ and in Christ alone and nothing else. God, I pray that as we sing this last song that you would build in us that type of faith that we indeed would pass the test as we take our refuge in you and in you alone. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.